This is Radio 314 on the Red Ice Radio Network. Welcome everyone, this is Lana. Thanks for tuning in. Joining me is Inez Cyrus, also called Annie Cyrus. She's an Iranian-born woman who rejected Islam and fled Iran to America legally in her teens. She came to the U.S. after years of persecution, torture, and even imprisonment. Today, she is a graphics specialist and web developer, but also maintains her own online show, The Unknown, where she educates and informs all who listen on the reality and threat of Islam. She'll share her story, and we'll also talk about Islam in the West, Trump, and how liberals are responding to Islamic terrorism and invasion. Inez Cyrus, up next. Inez, welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Well, since you're new to a lot of people, I think that we should go way back to the beginning. I mean, you were born in Iran, right? And then when did you leave Iran and come to the U.S.? Uh, yes, I was born in Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, I was in Iran until I was 15. Uh, I left the country at age 15. However, I made it to United States of America at age 18. So there was a process of three years until I could get my paperwork, you know, get approval, get my um, I-94 visa and then come in. How was it leaving? I mean, you, you've been through so much there and I want to get into that. But how was the process escaping? Um Emotionally, it was a mix of a lot of emotion. Um, definitely, um, I would say very scary. At the same time, um, very that proud moment when you feel like you're finally taking control of your life, even if it means you're not going to make it, but you're still control. You're making the calls and you're making the decision. Um, and physically, obviously, because you are being smuggled out of country, it takes a lot of running and walking and, you know, swimming and hiding and all of that until you finally make it to oh, the is that next what happened? destination. You basically yes. fled? Exactly. Well, I want to know, you were imprisoned, I think you said 12 times before reaching the age of 14, really? Tell us about that. What happened is in, in all of Islamic countries, not just Iran, but all of Islamic countries, uh, there are many crimes that you easily commit. Especially someone like me, I'm I'm not a I'm not so much of a you know follower. I question every law, and if I don't make sense out of it, I will not follow it. So, um, for instance, one of the time I was arrested and put in um, prison was when I publicly started singing with my friends on the street on the way back from school, and it is illegal on the Sharia for a woman to publicly sing. <laughs> Um, another time, you know, I had nail polish on and it is illegal again for a woman in any Islamic country under Sharia. It's illegal to have any kind of um, makeup or anything that could be attractive to a man. It's illegal and it ca counts as a crime. So I did it. I always loved growing my nail and, you know, having nail polish and being all, you know, wom womanish. So I got arrested for that one. Now, the only thing is that when it says put in prison, sometimes you spend longer time, sometimes you spend just the overnight time in there. It just depends on your crime, you know, until you go to court and be sentenced to whatever the judge decides to sentence you to. But the only, um, not only, but the biggest, the scariest moment of it is there is no such a thing as a juvie center in Iran. So every time you're arrested, after age of nine, as a girl, because on the Sharia, again, at age nine, a girl becomes a full adult woman. So after age of nine, you are re responsible for your own actions and you can commit a crime. Therefore, every time you're arrested, you're put in the same uh, prison as adults. Hmm. And honestly, that's just horrifying. It's terrifying. Because at that age, even though me personally, even though I wanted to have my own rules and make sense out of everything. I still couldn't make sense out of a lot of things that was happening inside the cell that I was being kept. Let's say I had, I had a, you know, 40 something year old woman in that room who killed someone. Jeez. And it was just like, Oh my goodness, she killed someone and now she's going to kill me you know, for a, even for an adult that crosses your mind. Or I witnessed a suicide attempt once in prison. And it was the first time in my life when I saw someone try to kill themselves or even saw that much blood because she cut her wrist and her neck. 
So um, the mental torture it gives you is what could easily break a kid to decide to just follow blindly and, you know, let them brainwash you. That's really sad. And then I wonder, where was your father? How could your father let this happen? But I know that you were also sold into marriage, correct? So did your father do that? Yes. Uh, my father was a sheikh, which is also known as an imam here. Um, he was a very extremely religious Muslim man. Um, he believed everything that comes in Quran and Hadith and Sharia. He never, not only he never questioned it, but if anybody else would ever question it, they wouldn't get a good you know, answer out of him. Normally, myself, if I asked anything, I would get a punch or a beat up for questioning. So to his eyes, I deserved everything I got because I wasn't following the Islamic rules. And so who did he marry you to? How did that, how did that go? I mean, what happened? One of the main reasons um, in Iran or any Islamic country, again, one of the reasons the child marriage is very popular, one of the reasons is financial struggle, because you can't ask for money in return of your daughter. The second one is you constantly worry about the dishonor your daughter is going to bring in, especially a daughter like me who keeps breaking the law. So the best way to get rid of that responsibility is to, you know, marry her off. So if she decides to do something that's shameful, then it's on the husband's uh, honor, not yours. And that was his reasoning. He didn't like the responsibility. He never did. Uh, he actually left us at early age of, I, I was very young when he left us. And his reason was we weren't Muslim enough. And he, we were basically making him uh, less of a Muslim by living with us. So his main reason for wanting to get rid of me ASAP, main reason was, you know, I'm going to marry you off. So your husband's going to teach you how to live life. And, you know, he's going to control you and you won't be able to keep getting arrested and, you know, be, bring shame to me and the family. And the second reason was because of his addiction to opium, um, this man offered a very good deal of offering of opium to him. Uh, almost a usage of a full month of opium. That's a lot of money yeah. for someone who's addicted. When you had to flee, were you still married to him or did you get a divorce or how did that happen? No, I was still married to him. Uh, that, was the, that was the whole deal of me realizing there is no hope in this country because I tried to get a divorce and I was denied a divorce. Um, I don't know if you or your listeners do know in, in any Islamic country again and in Iran, uh, the right to divorce belongs to the man. Mm -hmm. As a woman, there are very, very, very small chances for you to be able to get a divorce. And even if you manage to do so, you're still in danger because the family, your family or the family of the uh, husband can always come back, hunt you down for, you know, bringing shame to their family. And my case was one of those cases. My, my only plea was that he beats me. And the judge didn't agree that beating is a crime because I wasn't obeying my husband. So my punishment was a beating. Mm. Therefore, they denied my request for divorce. That, that was exactly the moment that I knew no one in this country is going to save me. And I'm not going to save myself unless I just take off and go. And were there, other, there were other people that fled with you? Yes, I mean, you'd be surprised to know the number of Iranians that fled daily. Like in Turkey, um, in three or three cities of Turkey, every day there are average of three to six Iranians who come in who fled Iran for many different reasons, but mainly the reason is exactly this, that having no rights in Iran is what makes them flee. Makes me think of Bolshevik Russia. My ancestors had to flee the Bolsheviks, and they had to be really sneaky, and they actually walked all the way into China and they saw several people die along the way because it was such a difficult journey. But they also saw people get shot and killed because they were caught. So is it kind of like that? Would they kill people if they saw them trying to escape? Yes, it's the same thing. Now, if you're being smuggled out and if you get caught, if you try to run, they will shoot. They have the order to shoot to kill. If you don't and you surrender, uh, they will arrest you take you back to Iran, and then you will be put in prison and your charge will be propaganda against the regime because you were trying to flee. And automatically, if you're fleeing, you're going to tell people what's happening inside the country. So 
no evidence needed. You were fleeing, so you were trying to do a propaganda against the regime, which could end up giving you a sentence between six years in prison all the way to execution. Jeez. Now, what is the legal age of marriage in Iran? Is it like nine years old or something? There is no legal age of marriage in Iran. Um, by law, at age 13 for a girl is when you can consummate the marriage. But as far as marrying a kid, a baby girl, infant girl can be promised and sold to a family. Yucky. God, this is awful. <laughs> now, earlier you, know. you mentioned stuff about makeup and nail polish and stuff. Now, underneath the burqa, when the women are at home, do, can they wear that kind of stuff at home? Oh, well, yes, you, they can. Uh, now, the nail polish, you can't unless you just have the you know, uh, potential of constantly removing it. The reason you can't have makeup or nail polish comes from, one, on the street, if you do it, you're seducing a Muslim man and you're forcing him to commit a sin. Um, the second reason for it is the Islamic prayer requires a, a prayer wash-up before you do the prayer. And when you do the wash-up, you cannot have any, anything on your skin or your nail. So if you are having a makeup or you're wearing a nail polish, therefore that means you're not doing the prayer, which is a big no-no. You know, it just against the rule of Sharia if you're not doing your daily prayer. Now, the daily prayer is five times a day. Normally, if you're not going to put a, put a nail polish and then remove it every two hours so you can do your wash-up prayer. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so behind closed doors, a lot of people do. Yes, I mean, a lot of people even, as I have said, over 70%, 60 70% of Iranians are not really practicing Muslims. They're just forced to it. Because in Islamic Republic of Iran, as soon as you're born, automatically by law of country, your birth certificate will say Muslim. You don't have a choice. You're born a Muslim. And you will have no choice but to pretend to be a Muslim and practice the Islamic um, culture, or you're going to get yourself killed. Therefore, a lot of people pretend um, if they have a nail polish, they will wear gloves on the street, which adds to their respect because they're trying to say, oh, look, I'm wearing a complete hijab. I'm not showing skin. So you don't get in trouble for wearing the gloves. But if you remove the glove, you will see they have long nail and nail polish and all of that. However, you're always um, in danger because uh, in Iran, there are five different type of police. And one of them is morality police, and they actually have no limits. They can literally just knock the door down, come in and search your house without a warrant. Now, when it comes to the burqa, who actually started that tradition? Because I heard originally it was something that women had started. Is that true? In general, it was not, no, it wasn't. It was ordered by Muhammad himself. And how it happened was um, after one of his wars, uh, they brought all the slaves, sexist slaves, into the city and... Um, one of his wives was outside bringing water home and she wasn't wearing the burqa. And the people of town started, you know, talking to her and trying to pick her up and things like that. So Mohammed came up with this idea that Muslim women will start wearing a burqa, the sexist slaves will not wear it, so people of town know who they can rape easily or who they have to respect. So that's how the burqa came into, because in Quran itself, it never talks about the full burqa. It talks about you have to cover yourself completely, including a head wrap, um, in order to be respected and not be abused and molested. That was the Quranic verse. But then when, as I said, when this uh, event happened in Medina, then Muhammad was like, okay, I need to find a way where my people will know who they can touch and who they cannot touch. So here, burqa. We're going to start wearing burqa. So if you see a woman wearing a burqa, you leave them alone. You know, they're, you know, respected Muslim woman. If they're not wearing it, then go ahead and grab them and do whatever you want to do with them because they're sexist slaves or what your right hand possesses, basically. So many questions I have for you, but, but I have to ask the Quran. I mean, what does it really say about women? Uh, the Quran, okay, there is a verse in Quran, um, it's called the woman, explains itself. 176 verses explains what a woman is, how to treat a woman, and how not to treat a woman. The bottom line of Quran is a woman is counted as a half of a man. It's a verse within Quran, no question about it. It counts a woman has half the right of a man. The second thing on that surah mentions that the man is in control of a woman 
because Allah has given man a better and full brain, which didn't give the woman. The third dimension in there is the woman was created for one purpose only, for two purposes, sorry, for one, the number one purpose was to satisfy the man's sexual needs, secondly, to continue the generation of Mohammedans, which means Muslims. These are the only duties of a woman in Islam. I have to say, I mean, it wasn't always this bad in Iran. I mean, I've, I've seen like Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, Turkey. It used to be secular before, you know, foreign and Zionist intervention. I saw pictures of women in the 50s wearing Western clothing, right? What do you know about that? Well, um, Iran, and one of the reasons I always say I was born and raised in Islamic Republic of Iran is because in 1979 is when Iran became an Islamic country. Now, before that, um, Iran used to be known as mini America of Middle East. Mm -hmm. We had almost the same constitution in Iran. It was when the Pahlavi dynasty was in Iran. We had the late king of Iran, Reza Pahlavi. You had the freedom of speech. You had the freedom of religion. You had all that freedom. If you wanted to be a Muslim, go ahead and be a Muslim, but leave the non-Muslim alone. You want to wear the burqa, you do that, but leave the people who don't alone. So, yes, it was a very modern country. A um, lot of people were actually free to get obtain visas and come to Western countries for education and then come back to Iran to help the technology and, you know, making the country more modern. However, in 1979, a revolution happened. Now, one thing a lot of people don't know about this revolution, everybody, you know, blames Carter and other Western countries. Well, basically, the revolution didn't start as an Islamic revolution. It, it started with the different groups in Iran who wanted to overthrow Shah because they believed he's giving too much freedom to the country. However, in the middle of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini came in and hijacked the revolution, and that's when it got completely out of control. Even Western countries couldn't do anything about it anymore. He basically hijacked it from France, all the way from France, he hijacked the revolution. And finally, they won the revolution. He came in with a bunch of promises, including, I'm going to give everybody free housing, free food, free gas, free this, free that. He came in, he took over. And officially to this day, he basically um, obtained his power illegally by the law of United Nations. To this day, the king of Iran was never decrowned, but he came in anyways. And the first thing he did was he started killing people. So he guaranteed his power by fear. He started scaring people to, if you disagree with me, with me I will kill you. Within this first two months of his power, he killed over 3,200 people, Iranian people, Christians, Baha'is, those who didn't agree to wear the hijab because as soon as he came in within 10 days, he has started making hijab mandatory in Iran. And that's when people realize, uh-oh, we were tricked. Mm. He lied, but it was way too late. And since then, the Islamic regime has been in Iran and they've been just basically, ma they maintain their control by fear. Sure. Yeah. Iran has the highest number of execution in the entire planet. Now, they do those and publicly? Yes, some of them are publicly. Some of them are not. Depends on what it is. They do what's called, um, we call it in Farsi, normal crimes. So whatever is, um, whatever is um, approved by the rest of the planet, let's say a drug dealer, a murderer, they do those publicly. But those who are political prisoners, they normally end up being killed and never revealed that they were killed. They basically just say, we don't have them. We release them. We don't know where they are. We, they become missing people. Mm. But then there's a mass grave somewhere that uh, literally they kill Baha'i and Christians and then just dump their bodies into the mass grave. But nobody can actually prove they did it because it's, in, it's not in public eyes. Well, I also want to ask and get back to the women question. It seems that there's also a lot of, you know, Muslim women that don't mind living under Sharia. I mean, I've seen a lot of stories, unless it's fake, where they actually don't want to be rescued. They reject, you know, Western feminism. They think it's garbage. So are there some women that actually do enjoy living under Sharia? In a simple answer, yes. But one thing you need to um, keep in mind is then the, the torture and brainwash that happens to women, it's not as simple as, 
okay, somebody can rescue me and I can be freed. Sure, yeah. Because the brainwash doesn't tell you that, okay, if you try to flee, I will catch you and kill you. No, the brainwash from the moment you're born is if you try to disobey Islam, you will die, you will go to hell. And this and this and that, gonna like seriously, they're going to tell you such a horror story. Hearing it over and over, it becomes a Stockholm Syndrome, right? Even if you do have the opportunity of not wanting to follow Islam anymore, you keep thinking, okay, when I die, all of this is going to happen to me. I don't want it to happen to me, so I'm going to give in and I'm going to continue obeying it. Are there, yes, there are, I mean, we have mentally ill people everywhere. There are some people, some women who think this is the right way of living life and they don't mind it and they are actually against, you know, the way we live in the West. But the number is like really low. A lot of people, a lot of women, we have cases when we try to rescue, they easily say, no, it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. You literally hear them saying, it's not worth it. Those are the people who, who've been deeply brainwashed. They just can't escape that possibility that I will die and such a horrible thing is going to happen to me. I'm just going to keep obeying. Now, for me, I'm not a fan of any Abrahamic religions. I think of myself as more, you know, pagan. I like a lot of the European pre-Christian traditions. And Islam's only 1,400 years old, right? So it's it's pretty new. So was there a native spirituality before that was something totally different? In Iran? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, actually, I don't know if you're familiar with Zarastorian. Yes, I am. Zarastorian was born in Persia, which is the old name of Iran. And that's exactly why um, some people like myself, we call ourselves and we practice Zarastorian because by birth, our right is Zarastorian. Mm-hmm, exactly. Any Persian born was Zarastorian. Actually, this was a question for some people saying, oh, we study Zarastorian and you can't convert. How did you? Like, well, I was born one. They hijacked me and named me a Muslim, but my blood as a Zoroastrian blood, so I don't need to convert. You know? So yes, before the first time when Islam hijacked Persia, it was all Zoroastrian. Yeah, and it was probably much better. You know, I, I think of how much harm actually the Abrahamic, these uh, monotheistic religions have done in, in many cultures. You know, I mean, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, there's been a lot of wars and all kinds of damage. All kinds of brainwashing has really affected people. What do you think? I would completely agree. Uh, one of the one of the things that I, I normally don't talk about my faith on any of my videos or my interviews for a very long time, even when I was asked, I would reject the answer. One of the main reasons I decided to do so was the entire um, base of Islam and the entire violence they go with is when there was the first rejection. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they shouldn't have rejected Islam. I'm not saying that. What I'm trying to say is that based on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the war from all the way from crusade to today of Syrian refugees killing Christians, this was all just a matter of every single religion is calling it freedom. But at the end of the day, there is no freedom within any of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The war, it's, it's, a, it's a war on humanity. It became more important what's your religion than you are a human. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's, that's where I don't get him. I always say on my page, on my website, I say I don't argue with religion. My fight is against Islam because I don't even call it a religion. It's an ideology. Mm-hmm. And I also don't have enough education. I wasn't raised a Christian or uh, Jewish or any other religion to know enough to want to take a you know debate on it. But what I do know is, at some point, we all need to stop. I do not care if you're a Christian or not. I don't care if you're Jewish or not. I, I don't care what's your faith. If you're a human, I am fighting for you. I have cases that we are handling that are Sunni Muslim. I don't even care they're Sunni Muslims. Some people are like, you're fighting Islam. Like, I'm fighting Islam. I'm not fighting Muslims. Because I know a huge number of Middle Easterns were born into it. This man doesn't have a choice, just like I didn't. If I was still in Iran, I wouldn't have the right to wear my farvahar and proudly stand and say I'm a Zoroastrian. They would have killed me. 
Therefore, I will even fight for the Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim. As long as I know they're human, I will fight for them. We, we definitely need to break this whole division of my faith, faith is better than yours, mine is better than yours. Because at the end of the day, we were all born as human. The secondary was our sex. The third up part of it is our faith and religion. Now, what would you like to see happen regarding Islam? I mean, what's the answer to push it back? Because now we see, because the doors of mass immigration are open, we see Islam literally flooding into Western countries now. So what do you think? I know it's the big question, but what's the answer? Do we close the borders, Actually, send them home? What do we do? To be honest, I don't think the solution is to push back. The solution is to get rid of Islam needs to be wiped off. It needs to become illegal to even practice it. That's, a, that's what I fight for. I, I'm trying to prove Islam is not a religion, therefore a freedom doesn't apply to it. A religion is about faith. It's about choice. Islam doesn't have any of them. Islam is submission. So Islam needs to become illegal in every country because it's not even possible to moderate Islam. There is no way to rewrite Quran. There is no way to rewrite how Muhammad lived his life. And Sharia, as we know, is the combination of Quran, Hadith, and Muhammad, Sunnah, not Sunni, Sunnah, which is the guidance life of Muhammad. Put these three together, you get Sharia. So if you can't change Quran and you can't change Sunnah, how do you change the religion? You mm -hmm. can't. We always hear, not all Muslims, right, after each terrorist attack, and there's been so many attacks lately, you know, so... Again, yeah, is it a religion of peace? I mean, what's your average Muslim really like? People try and argue that this isn't usually how Muslims are. Yes, but I'm sure you've heard. They say there is 2.6 uh, 2 million uh, Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the number they say? 2.6 million are Muslim, but only 120,000 of them or 12% of them are extremists. Now, I, I always want to say this. The number of 2.6 that everybody's hearing about is an incorrect number. Let me tell you why. In Islamic Republic of Iran, when you're born, you count as Muslim. When they say 2.6 million Muslim, they are counting those who were born into it as well. That doesn't count. Look, I will always be counted as a Muslim because I was born in Iran. But I, I stand and say I'm not a Muslim. So that's a wrong number. That's a wrong percentage. I have always said a true Muslim, by definition, what's a Muslim? A Muslim is who follows Islam. If you follow Islam, automatically that makes you extremist. Because Allah tells you in Quran, in 19 different verses, that find the unbeliever and behead them. So if you want to pick and choose your religion, you can't call yourself a Muslim. You either go all the way and follow every step of Quran and Muhammad, which makes you a killer, or you don't. So the numbers are incorrect. There is no such a thing as moderate Muslim, and there's no such a thing as peaceful Muslim. Those who call themselves a peaceful Muslim are the one who were born into it, and unfortunately had no choice but to be brainwashed and start a Stockholm Syndrome. They don't kill people, but they're not going to stop some other Muslim from killing people either. And so what is the, the goal of jihad then? Is it to, to convert the whole world or kill them? Yes. The last day, the promised last day of Islam is when the entire planet goes back. Now, remember, in Islam it says every human being was born a Mohammedian, which makes it a Mohammedian, comes from Mohammed's blood, so Muslim. The last day is the day that there is no one left on the planet except Muslims. One of the reasons you're allowed to convert, they give you a choice of convert or kill, right? Mm -hmm. The reason you can convert is because they believe everybody was born a Muslim anyways. So you just want to go back to your roots. Mm. Now, there's one ex exception that as a Jewish person, you don't have the right to convert back because you were cursed by Allah and you do not have a way back. So Jewish people don't get the chance of convert. They get the choice of kill. That's all. Convert. They really do hate Jews, right? That is the Absolutely. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, but they don't seem to go to Israel and pick on them so much. <laughs> they seem to come to European countries more and blow things up. Now, how do you see this so-called, you know, refugee crisis into Western lands playing out? I mean, when I look at it, being in Europe, it's just it's just an all-out invasion. Most of these all men coming in, they're not refugees. But it's only European countries that are forced 
to take in all these hordes of people calling themselves refugees. The rich Gulf countries, they're not taking in any. So how do you see this playing out? Well, honestly, if we don't put a stop on it, it's just a matter of time until every European country will become an Islamic country. Yeah. Because their law is no matter where you go, you will have to follow Sharia. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to force Sharia into every country's law. And Sharia always overrides any human rights. It does. I always call it, say Sharia is a, is a war on humanity. Simple. Because the first thing it tells you is, in Quran itself, it never refers to people as creation of Allah. It says a slaves of Allah. Even Allah looks at us as as slaves. You obey. I mean, for some reason, I mean, I can't stand liberals in the West. They just drive me mad. But a lot of them, you know, there's atheists and then there's uh, other kinds of liberals. But they all seem to be okay with Islam. They they seem to love it. They're even defending terrorism in some ways. Have you noticed that? Yes, I have. And I actually have have had debates with them. And here's the bottom line. Some of them are literally uneducated, period. They have no clue what Sharia is at all. They just want to go with the nice face they want to always keep that, you know, I'm going to respect you, whomever you are. Now, there's other group of them that actually I had this debate with this um, gentleman who said, listen, we are giving too much freedom to people. And that's why our society is becoming sinful. So if we bring Sharia, we take control and we eliminate the sin in our country. And I looked at him like, hello, are you really a person? Like, is there a brain cell in your head? Because <laughs> what you just said made absolutely zero sense. Every single one of them are coming up with a different way. They don't love Sharia. They look at Sharia as a tool to take control of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is. Sharia is the best tool to control your people. Look at Iran right now. Back in 2009, Students, university students, and a lot of young people decided to march on the streets and just demand. They didn't. They weren't even demanding the change of regime. They were just demanding for their votes because everybody, you know, there was a rig in the election and people were pissed off. They marched on the street and so many of them got killed. So many of them got arrested, put in prison, and disappeared from there. That since 2009, not a single attempt has been made by people. That's called control. When you kill people on the street, the next generation is not going to have what it takes to march again and try to overthrow you. And that's how Islam is anyways. As I said, submission. Yeah, and, so, and what you see too in, in European countries, our boys have become so soft. I mean, America, maybe they're still hardened a little more, but Europe, you know, they've become too tolerant to where they just bend over and then, you know, before they know there's going to be mosques everywhere, right? Exactly. And that, that's what, that's where the liberal are looking at it opposite. Instead of thinking that because of how our society is today, it's easier for them to invade our country. Yeah. They're looking at it as a good thing. Look, they're going to teach our kid. I, the same guy said, listen, you know what they're going to teach your boy? They're going to teach your boy that a woman is a property. They're going to teach your boy to be a rapist. Is that what you want? And he's like, no, they're not going to teach him that because I know how I raised my boy. My boy will never hit a woman. I'm like, are you sure about that? He's like, yeah, I'm positive. But they will show him if he tries to do this and that, then they're going to kill him. I'm like, and you're okay with that? He's like, yeah, because he's not going to do it, so they're not going to kill him. I'm like, I can't find logic. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they have a logic behind what they're doing, but they are basically, first of all, what I do believe is liberals, especially here in the United States, they don't love America. They don't. No, they hate it. And anything that would cause America to fall apart, they will go for it. They won't even blink. They won't even consider the consequences. Like right now, look at Hillary Clinton. Yeah. You really think he does, she doesn't know the consequences of things she's doing? Of course she does. She yeah, just it's like they, they want to destroy everything. They have this, exactly. almost have a death wish or something. It's strange. You know? Well, it all comes from, again, I go back to being uneducated. And I'm not referring to going to university and get a master or a bachelor's or associate degree. No, I'm talking about the actual no- knowledge of knowing what's coming or what is it you're choosing, what is it you're siding with. They don't take the time to educate. They just, they, our, our society has become became so lazy. Yeah, sure. 
I know, and, and uh, history is just repeating people. itself. I mean, Europe's pushed back Islamic invasions before. We've already fought very hard to do that, right? So now it's just we're just inviting it right back in again. No problem. Exactly. I mean, look at Turkey today. When Ataturk came to power, he basically overthrew the entire Khalifa back then and got rid of Islam and all of that. Years later, boom, they're back in again. It's becoming the same Turkey it was before. Now, I don't know how much you're following in Europe, but now, I mean, there really is a rape crisis since the doors of mass immigration have opened. We've, we've seen an influx of a lot of Muslims coming in there. They just rape women and do horrible things to them. Sweden has become the rape capital of Europe now, which is devastating. It was never a problem like that before. But rape is, is it's common, right, under Islamic rule. But that, exactly. They are not doing anything wrong to their own understanding. They're just following orders of Allah and Muhammad. Because that is what it is. You have to shame a non-believer woman. And that's how you shame them. You take control of them. The second reason for it is, as Muhammad says on the Hadith and the Sunnah, it says, when you invade a, a town, because back then it wasn't a ball country, it was when you invade a town, you make sure to impregnate every woman mm. to have Muhammadian kids. And that's how you grow the population of Muhammadians in that town. Yeah, because we also see them, even amongst their own circles, they're literally trying to outbreed places where they go to. Like in Sweden, they're just having tons of kids literally trying to outbreed the Swedish population. Well, I don't know if you know or not, but in Islamic Republic of Iran, any kind of birth control is illegal. Mm. You, you, can't, you can't even have access to it. They don't sell it anywhere. Now, we have the extremes of, you know, women living under Sharia law, and then we have these crazy feminists in, in our Western countries. I mean, God, and they never say anything about women like you who have come from these situations, right? They just kind of want to go after European men all the time. And in my view, we have it the best. You would probably agree, too. That's why you're here. But what do you think about feminists in uh, Western countries today? I have actually, I have called them out many times on many of my unknown episodes. I have asked them. I have reached out and said, you really want to prove to be a feminist? Please help me help the woman under oppressed Islam. I have never heard back. And yes, I agree. For them, it's not so much of being a feminist. It's all about a charade. They just love the spotlight. And at the moment, picking on Islam doesn't give you a spotlight. It gives you a lot of death threat. So they're not going to touch that. They're going to touch something that's going to give them fame, a spotlight, and any popularity that comes with it. I don't count them as a real feminist at all. No, they, they a lot of them hate about women. Things that makes me laugh. Sometimes it's like, really, that's your biggest problem right now? Yeah, I mean, they never talk about female genital mutilation, do they? No, they absolutely don't. And trust me, probably if you talk to some of them, they won't even know it exists. They think it's just some sort of myth because they're too busy worrying about... I mean, I have seen videos and pictures of Western feminist groups keep holding up signs saying, refugees welcome. <clears throat> I'm like, well, Why? Why are you welcoming? Do you know when you're welcoming them, you're welcoming rape on yourself? Yeah. Because part of culture of Islam is to rape you. Yeah. It's their duty to do it. Yeah, and they probably come in and see these girls that are just like naive and smiling. And hey, they just think, oh, easy target. You know? And we've seen that happening like crazy. And then the media, though, is trying to cover up a lot of this stuff. They're trying to cover up the truth about uh, Islam and how they treat women. Why, in your view, is this happening? I have my power. theories, but I want to know your theory. I always say that a lot of people think I'm one of those cons conspiracy theorists. It's the power. Here's what it is. Middle Eastern Islamic countries have the best offering of power, financial power, to offer to Western governments and, and politicians. Now, media, well, I mean, we all know media is controlled by government. As much as we like to think that we are living in a free country, we're not at the end of the day. Oh, it's Everything just a few conglomerates in America. It's really just a few powerful people that control the media. Yeah, exactly. So the power, unfortunately, greed in people is causing this. You think that's all it's about? It's not about uh, some kind of war on the West? Because I feel like there is an uh, elite faction that literally wants to destroy the West. And I see that it's in motion and this is part of it, you know, using other cultures to come in and destroy the West. Well, that's, that, that is part of that power I'm talking about. 
I, I, be, before we, a few minutes ago, I was saying that the best way for them to be in power is to have control over their people. And the laws and constitution of West doesn't give our politicians that much of power. But if they do break it down, if they make it fall and replace it with such a powerful control tool of Sharia, boom, they have it. So do you think that if, if the West was to be destroyed, I mean, we're, I, I get very concerned about where Western civilization is heading. I think our, our own liberals and our own elites are doing a fine job destroying everything. But if Western civilization were to go, to be destroyed, if our European people were to be replaced, what do you think would happen? I mean, would the world feel that repercussion? To be honest, I don't think it will get there. Because at the end of the day, even though it's a very small number, but there are still a number of people who are very much awake and they actually know what's going on. So when it, they're waiting too long to fight back, mm -hmm. but I do believe we will get to where they're going to fight back because this is not the first attempt of Islam to try to take over West. Yep. I don't think it's going to get there, but I do believe that the, the politicians and government, people in power will definitely do their very best to make sure it does happen. Me personally, I am terrified of thinking if the West, Western culture goes away. I don't have anywhere to go, to be honest. My, my personal fight is because I never am willing to go back to the life I had for the first 15 years of my life. And I know there are so many people out there like me who escaped it and they're not willing to go back. So that's why I say I don't believe it's going to get there. I don't think they're going to be able to achieve their goal. But it's going to get very ugly and it's going to get very close. Now, you mentioned earlier how, you know, Islam really has no no place for Jews, right? They don't accept them at all. But there's a lot of American and European Jews that are, are really opening up the doors to mass immigration. They're actually inviting in this uh, strong, you know, uh, Muslim population. Why would that be? To be honest, I don't understand what they do. The only thing I do hear from them explaining is that we are trying to... Um, we're trying to um, show the love to overwrite the hate within them. To me, that's like, uh, well, that's not going to happen, but I could never make any sense out of it. I had a friend of mine who I explained, I brought the Quran, I put it in front of her and explained what she will count in Islamic society. She said, well, if they want to kill me, let them kill me, but I'm not going to hate them. <laughs> She's like, uh... Okay. Yeah, I've heard this before. You know, if you hate them or if you fight them, they win. I'm like, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> it makes no sense. Well, exactly. It doesn't make sense to me that or when when um when um Obama talks about, you know, oh, it's because they weren't hugged enough. It's yeah, because exactly. they were hated. I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah. It's been going on for fourteen hundred years. It's not something that started yesterday. And what is it to love them for? Every time they come and blow themselves up and kill thousands of people, every time they barge into a, a gay nightclub and kill people, is that what we, we're supposed to go hug them and say, good job? Yeah, but every time after these attacks happen, that's what the media is saying, right? We need to love, we need to open up our hearts, and you know, stopping immigration is wrong because basically you'll, you'll piss them off and then they'll do more bad things. So we have to just be nice to them and tolerate everything they do, right? Until they kill every single one of us, exactly. And that's what I say on, on some of my videos, I always say, I'm like, you see, some, some liberals think that I'm this hate preacher and, you know, I'm filled with hate. I'm like, listen, <laughs> listen, I, I'm not a spreading the hate. I'm a spreading the truth. Now, if it sounds like hate, then you should realize Islam is about hate. Yep. You know, don't, don't blame the messenger. There's sunnah, their hadith, and the rules. Now, if you think it sounds like hate, don't you think you should realize the actual so-called religion is the hate and not me? Well, to most lefties and liberals today, I mean, the truth really is they, they call that hate. You know, <laughs> So it's like hate facts, right? We always joke around about that. Exactly. That, that's the thing. I get a lot of attack from liberals saying, well, listen, because you had few bad experiences doesn't give you the right to come and say these things. I'm like, wait, wait, did you just call that a few bad experiences? And I'm the one who always said, I always do. I said, I actually had, ha I didn't have the worst. I witnessed my friends go through a lot more than I did. To this day, I pick up cases from Iran every day and we do campaigns for them. They're, they're taking a hell of a lot more than I did. 
if you think mine was some bad experiences, maybe you should follow up with everything that I do. You should listen to every name I'll bring in front of camera. Every day, every single day, people are dying. Women are being raped, as you said. Somebody came with this debate to me that, listen, don't you think maybe the reason that they're raping a lot of women in Sweden is because Swedish people are constantly talking bad about Muslims? I was like, oh, so they have the right to rape a woman because she said bad thing about them? <laughs> Let me ask you and this. Actually, and actually, Swedes, are they love Islam for some reason. So that's not even true. Yeah. Exactly. That's the point. It's like, no, wait. They are being raped daily because they actually opened the door. Yeah. Because they were loving. They were, you know, nice to them. That, that's the biggest mistake. Yes, I am actually completely with the decision of stopping this immigration. Unless you can wet them. You can make sure they are who they say they are. From what I understand in Europe, they don't even ask their age anymore. They don't ask their name anymore. No, and plenty of times the guys, the guys say they're 15 and it turns out they're 35. I mean, come on, they're just lying. And then they come in and they get, you know, free houses and money and welfare and they just misbehave. Exactly. They get a free housing and then they burn the house down. I mean, how much do how much does it take for someone to finally realize that Let's just call it for what it is. We see articles every day, videos, articles, you know, websites talking about it. Syrian refugee killed someone. Uh, no. Stop saying Syrian refugee. You really need to say Muslim refugee. When they went and beheaded a priest, that had nothing to do with race. It had everything to do with religion. Yeah. So we need to put down our race card. Because that's another thing liberals are doing, playing the race card constantly. The, f the most funny thing I ever been called is a racist. I'm like, wait, oh, I get how called can that all I the be time. a racist <laughs> when I'm talking about a country? I, was, I am a Persian. I cannot be racist toward Persians. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They'll call you racist no matter what. That's just what they do. That's the thing. But we need to eliminate this race card. We, need, we really need to put it down. Because... Either they re Syrians or not, they walk in there screaming Allahu Akbar when they're beheading. Allahu Akbar isn't a race. Allahu Akbar is an Islamic phrase. The, the Allah is the greatest. Yeah, and then but the crazy thing is, there's other countries like let's see, the, even the Gulf countries. They're rich, right? And they're not taking in any refugees. These are some of their own people that they share some blood with, right? Well, but it, but it's only Europe expected to take all of them in now. Well, that's exactly the point. They already have the country under control. They don't need more Muslims to invade. They need to send the Muslims to countries that are not invaded yet. That's why it's, it is, we, we don't even, we shouldn't even call it the refugee crisis. We should say invasion crisis. Yeah. That is what they're doing here. Are you telling me that out of 2,200 refugees who came in, none of them were married? None of them had mothers? None of them had daughters? None of them had sisters? They left them behind in Syria to do the war for them. And they're so little poor. I saw a picture, actually. It was very interesting. It was a picture of a couple of the refugees in the camp. I believe it was in Germany. And I'm like, honestly, I live in America and I don't look as fancy as this guy. <laughs> He's all, you know, muscled up in perfect haircut and a brand new T-shirt. like New sneakers and an iPhone. Refugee. Exactly. I remember when I was a refugee. We, I, I literally had to go 30 days with a bag of, uh, bag, of, bag of potatoes. I've been a refugee. I know how being a refugee looks like. I know how it sounds like. And you were probably grateful and thankful for it. Any help that you I got. I was. Every day was a blessing because I survived, because I still have one day closer to making it to better life. And when I came to America, I didn't start burning down houses and cars and saying, this is not what I was expecting. Anything that was offered to me, I would just take it and say, thank you. The very first priority of all these mailing refugee camps is that I haven't had sex in six months, so I had to rape someone. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And then Germany goes and make a sex website to teach them how not to rape their woman. Yeah, I know. I saw that. Do you, re do you really think a man at age like 20 something, 30 something, 40 something is going to be learning that? 
their mind is shaped already. People say a lot of things, you know, about Gaddafi and Hussein and the West, you know, they go in there and they take him out. But I think that was actually the wrong thing to do because these populations of men really need an iron fist to rule them, don't they? Because otherwise, if I mean, some of these rulers knew that you couldn't be soft with them. Otherwise, bad things would happen, right? They almost had to keep them in check. Exactly. That's somebody while ago, somebody asked me this very interesting question and said, okay, this is, you know, let's say there's a situation where you have a gun, no questions asked, you can pull the trigger and the target in front of you is Ayatollah Khamenei. Are you going to pull the trigger? I said, no. I said, why not? I'm like, because as soon as I kill him, a huge brainwashed Muslim men are going to be unleashed in my country and they're going to start killing every other person in my country. This man is evil. I hate him with every bone in my body. However, at the moment, he's the one stopping a lot of people in Iran to kill the rest of the people because mm -hmm. he wants to take a pleasure himself and kill him. Now, what are your thoughts on Trump? I personally uh, haven't voted in years, you know, no, never believed in politics. But this year, I'm definitely voting for Trump. But what are, what are your thoughts on him wanting to limit immigration, especially from, you know, unknown Islamic countries? I am actually, I'm also going to vote for Trump. I am all in for him. Um, and I always said, he is perfect. No, nobody is perfect. He has his own flaws. He has a very tricky way of talking. But two things about him made my mind to vote for him. One, at least he does say what he means. He's not politically correct. He's not afraid of saying what he thinks. I love that about this man. It kind of like me, you know, I'm, I just say it whatever, hate me, love me, I will say what I think. The second is he is the only one who is calling it out for what it is. He is saying that the problem with refugees is their Islamic mindset. And he is right. As a person who has, I lived, I, I, I had 18 years of Middle Eastern lifestyle and 14 years of American lifestyle. And I think that makes me eligible to be able to talk about the impossibility of coexistence of these two cultures yeah doesn't work it doesn't that's the thing islam cannot coexist period with nothing it just cannot coexist yeah it's supremacist it wants to take over i know i always hear these people talking freaking out about white supremacy and i'm like uh <laughs> what about islam it wants to come in and just rule everything and everyone exactly that that's how it works and i everybody can have their own opinion or have their own mindset. But again, it goes back to where you're born to it, when you're raised by it, you have the clear picture of it. Now, I was blessed to have the mind of my own to realize uh, starting age seven, I started questioning everything that I was told. Like, wait, what? So I'm seven year old and I have to wear the hijab and go to school at seven because the boys on the street might be seduced by my hair because I have beautiful hair. What are you talking about? I was seven. I'm, I always felt blessed and gifted to have that ability. But I can tell you, eight out of 10 don't. Uh, I've traveled around a little bit of uh, Qatar and Abu Dhabi, Bahrain. I've been to Egypt. I, I went to Israel, too. And it's funny because all those places, we dressed conservatively. Obviously, I was a young girl. I was with my parents. And uh, several times, like a couple times, my shawl slipped and my shoulder showed. I was in Israel in particular. I remember and some guy comes up to me and says, you need to cover up because you're making men lust. I was like, are you kidding? It's just like you see an elbow and that's enough for you to want to rape and lust and blame me for it. It's just amazing. Yeah, because that's the thing. They read a book that tell them Allah created woman to, to, to satisfy your need. I, did, I, 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 I was walking... Back in Iran, when I was there, I was walking on the street. One of the female officers, morality police, came to me and said, what are you doing? I was like, uh, walking home. Why? It's like, you're wearing a perfume. I'm like, yes, I am. That's illegal. I was like, what? You're walking and the scent coming out of you is seducing our brothers. Oh, boy. I looked Jeez. at her. I'm like, okay, so you're telling me I should... And I'm a teenager, right? I'm like, so you're telling me I should stink and kill people because I stink. So your brothers wouldn't be seduced. And that was the last thing I said, you know, handcuffs, taken to detention center, whatever, the whole nine yard. But to that extent, 
you can wear a perfume. There are actual banners in Iran on the streets when you are, walk. There are banners where it says, my sister, my fellow sister, do not let your, uh, what is it? I'm sorry, hard to translate from first to English, but it's kind of like, do not let your uh, momentarily need cause a sin for your fellow Muslim brother or something like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's a perfume. Yeah, so no no matter what is your fault, right? That's well, don't they also, don't women in some of those countries when they say, hey, I've been raped, they actually stone the woman to death or, or like yes. beat the woman up for saying that? Yes, in, in Iran also. Here's the thing. There are two possibilities. If you're raped, you can go and report the rape. Well, first thing you know is as soon as you're done reporting, you're on handcuffs, put in cell, because you seduced a man to do it. Now, if you're lucky and for whatever reason you get away and not be killed, then you have to deal with your family because you brought them shame. You're not a virgin anymore. Then they're going to kill you in name of honor killing. And nobody's going to ever marry you because you're not a virgin anymore. Yeah. Oh, so you have to be a virgin when you get married, huh? Absolutely. Because they literally take you to a doctor and get a confirmation. It, there's a documentary out there where a very brave woman in Iran made it with a hidden camera on her purse. And the second most um, money-making business in Iran after plastic surgeons are the doctors who actually fix your virginity. Really? The second most money-making because they, the girl knows they have no choice but to pay for it because if they are about to get married and it's exposed, they're going to be killed. They will be punished by death. Now, plastic surgery, what kind of surgery are they getting? Are they getting nose jobs and breast implants or what are they doing? Well, to be honest, I, it's, it saddens me to say, but anything they can get. Hmm. That, that's the thing. You see, when you, when you, I, I can, I can feel that part of them because you live in a country where you're not allowed to have makeup. You're not allowed to show anything but your face and your hand. You have to be covered constantly. And you are not allowed to have a boyfriend. You're, you're, you're not allowed to have anything. And you're a woman, you know, young woman who likes, you know, attention. What do you do? You go and make your face look like a plastic doll, hoping somebody's going to pay attention to you. So sad. Well, speaking of that, you know, Islam is creeping in right in the UK and other European countries. Uh, the first Muslim mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, he gets in and what he immediately does is he teams up with some uh, European feminists to ban this so-called, you know, sexist, demeaning advertisements, which is basically basically just like showing pretty women in bikinis or something for some advertisement. But it's interesting how that's coinciding with Muslims who think, you know, a woman in a bikini means she's a slut, right? But now the feminists are kind of like starting to team up with these Muslims about how women are looking and, and making claims of sexism, which is teaming up with the Muslims saying, yeah, women should be covered up. Isn't that interesting? Um, it is very interesting. But more than that, what's interesting to me is that how people are not making this simple connection. Yeah, I know. Normal people are not putting this two and two together, and it, it doesn't take a you know genius to put this two, 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 two and two together. But people are so. Sometimes I get so frustrated. Like Cersei, some mornings I wake up, I, I look at my messages that I receive from my people back in Iran or Turkey. Look at the names that were arrested the la day before, and I'm like, how do I save these people when people in the West are not even considering saving themselves? Yeah, I know. It's, it's awful. It's a scary, it's terrifying, and at the same time, it's heartbreaking to know that a beautiful, I mean, there are countries with beautiful culture, and, and that's the thing. I always say I'm looking at history repeating itself in a different location. Persia, if, if anybody's familiar with Persia, yeah. they have one of the strongest culture in music, mm -hmm. dance, art, all of it is gone. Today, as soon as you hear Iranian, you're like, oh, those Arab Muslims. Uh, no, we're not Arab Muslims. We're Persians. Yeah, so that's what Islam does, right? It destroys culture. It just wants to create yes. one monoculture. Exactly. The, 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 if you read the Constitution of Islamic Republic of Iran, the first language of the country is Farsi. And the second language mandatory is Arabic. Because Quran is in Arabic and you have to do the prayer in Arabic, that was the first time I got in trouble at the school because I got up and said, wait a minute. I talked to my teacher. I raised my hand. I had a question in this was my Quran teacher. She was like, okay, what's your question? I said, wait a minute. So Allah only understand one language 
and I got suspended from a school. The whole, you know, it was just a disaster because as a kid, my question was, why can't I do my prayer in Farsi? Why do I have to learn this language? And I am tested on and I have to pass the class in order to move up to my next class. It was so much of why after why for me that I literally asked that question. And I didn't have the right to ask that question. I just had to learn and do and not question it. Well, it's good that you're still so young and you've figured all this out and you're, you've are you started over a new life and it sounds like you're much happier, right? Oh, absolutely. But I'm not going to lie to you. It, it scares me to know that the very thing that I ran from is hunting me today in a country that I never dreamed it would happen. Well, the website is liveuptofreedom.com. Tell people what you're up to next and what other kind of things you're working on. Absolutely. Uh, I just started a new production uh, it's a weekly video series called Top 10. And what we bring is we actually talk about the top 10 crimes and laws and regulations of Islamic countries. So people can get more familiar with what Sharia is. Um, I have my show, The Unknown, where I share my own personal experiences from Iran and my friends and other people that I know of, again, to educate people on what um, Islam and Sharia means. Um, I will be soon starting a podcast where I will have guests to come in, ex-Muslims, uh, women who are active in the same industry as I am to, again, try to bring some light to what the real feminism means when it comes to Islam and Sharia. And um, I'm also still, after five years, proudly producing the Glass Off Gang show, which is a right-wing conservative politic talk show. Well, very nice. Thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed it, and I think that you're a lovely woman, so thank you. Oh, absolutely a pleasure. I thank you so much for, again, giving me this time. Yes, I know Islam isn't the only threat, I get that, but nonetheless, it is a threat compounded with many others, and it's only growing and getting stronger the more that come into Western countries. Now we see people being mass murdered in the name of Islam. It has no place in the West, and I have no room for it in my heart. If people don't want Judaism or Christianity, then why say yes to Islam? I will never be tolerant of Islam in the West. I do not want to live in a Europe surrounded by mosques that blast prayers through loudspeakers five times a day. I don't want to see halal food, and I certainly don't want to see women in burqas or men who treat women like servants. There's Muslim countries, so those who want this can move. But the West should close the doors to Islam and eliminate it from their lands. Our cultures are ancient and beautiful, and that is what we must embrace and resurrect on a grand scale. We need our own space to do this. There's no such thing as being multicultural in one country. One will always dominate and take over the others. It will pervade into every aspect of the current culture and change it. Islam is all about that, conquest. Redice.tv is our website. Members go to redicememembers.com for full access to all our content, including our Saturday live show, Weekend Warrior. Thanks for listening. Have a great night.
Barna yağmur dostamın no gülabat Barna yağmur dostamın no gülabat Kalamız Bar bu mide camelat Dur diyo şanımız Bar bu mide camelat Dur diyo şanımız Sadi ayek canek Sadi ayek canek Zanma ve ateş mümkünüm Sadi ayek Oh, oh. 